You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. You have claim? Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 3, page 88. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And there's the robot. Uh, huh? And the man. I am an outer man. Thank you for joining us. I don't know if we ever thank people right out of the gate. I'll, I'll try and do that next time. Oh, whoops, I just did it. This time you did it, yeah. Today's story is Willpower by Jason Stoddard. Jason Stoddard is an evil marketer, metaverse developer, and proponent of positive science fiction, though he has been known to enjoy a dystopia or two. He's a Theodore Sturgeon Memorial Award and Sidewise Award finalist, and editors at Futurismic, Sci-Fiction, Interzone, Strange Horizons, and other publications have been crazy enough to buy his stories. He lives in Los Angeles, California, with his wife and eight reptiles. Feel free to email Jason at strangeandhappy.com. Today's music is by Zero Project and Camerer, and we'd also like to thank Suzanne Early, Josh Roseman, Julie Hoverson, and Abigail Hilton for lending their voices to today's episode. Willpower by Jason Stoddard. Michael Delgado needed something to do. Today. His last welfare job had ended last Friday, which meant tomorrow morning was contract breach. The food card would stop working, and the ever-efficient Borgots of the Balboa Arms would be down to usher him out of his 300-square-foot studio apartment. Not that he'd miss it, with Van Nuys cranking to 105 today, and him with only a swamp cooler. He scanned quickly through the Willfare crap work and sinkers. Job 23091703425460. Dog walking. Cerritos area. 0.5D Willfare credit. Four dogs, large, aggressive, except no way, not for a half-day credit. Job 23091703425540. Street cleaning, crew of 16, Chinatown and surrounds, multi-day contract, except currently 11 accepted. Surrounds, as in southeast L.A., no way. Job 23091703511565. Research Assistant, UCLA Medical Campus. Great status. Includes transpo and housing. Minimum 45-day contract, 90 welfare creds. Extensible to 90 days. Standard disclaimers, except... And take a chance that the cancer they infect you with, they might not be able to cure? Oh, no. Michael Delgado frowned. The chant of the taxpayers echoing in his head... We pay your salary, so you do what we want. Needed for a smooth transition to a post-scarcity economy, they said. Allows them the dignity of productive work, they said. Gets them off the streets, they said. They who drove comfortably to jobs not yet outsourced, in SUVs with large leases not quite paid. And then... Job 23091703554443. Take my place on the Aries. 180-day contract. I'll vouch for the full 720 welfare days. Even if I have to pay him, I'm done. Except? Michael felt something like an electric shock as he eye blinked on except. Strange shivers worked up and down his spine. He heard something like a whisper deep within his mind. He felt suddenly strong, powerful, alive. Oh no. But he'd done it. Thank you for your acceptance of Willfare Job number 23091703554443. Present yourself at Edward Scaled Composites Virgin Facility, Mojave, California, by 5 p.m. today to begin work. No Willfare credit has been accrued to your account. 
Michael pounded a fist into his cheap plastic kitchen table. Fucking keywords, fucking Vesper, fucking Kanye BMI. What had he gotten himself into this time? Because it had to be a joke. Nobody would Will fare a Mars mission job. It had to be a cover for something that involved Hershey's syrup and chickens and octogenarians. And now he was screwed. He'd accepted, and that was that. Michael sighed and started looking up bus routes out to Edwards. The last vestiges of Vesper's adrenaline rush made him smile, as if in anticipation. Before he could leave, Angelica called. Her face wavered on the cheap roll screen. Behind her, big bouffant hairdos were being teased to life. Want to go to the one true shack? She said, batting her eyelashes. I got a big tip. My treat. I can't. Insta frown. Why not? I, I got a job. A real job or more of that welfare crap? Michael sighed. Angelica's eyes flickered down as she scanned the detail of his job. Oh, no! She said. Michael nodded. Why? I couldn't stop it. Insta-frown became insta-snarl. I thought you had it under control. I thought you were okay. Behind her, heads turned to look. This is good work. Worth a lot. They'll never let you on board! Angelica screamed. Don't, Don't I know, know it. it? Michael thought, but said nothing. You could banchise! She said. I'm not going to play dead music from Brains and Wallerstein tanks. You're already set up. Angelica, I... What else are you going to do? Michael looked away from the flat screen. I'm taking this job, he said. As he said it, the feeling of energy and elation came back. He shook his head, trying to shake the alien feelings. No! Angelica said. I have to, Michael said softly. Even if it's real, I won't be here when you come back. Michael looked down. I know. She waited. He said nothing. Her frown tightened once more. The image wavered and disappeared. At Edward's Scaled Composites Virgin, the reception area was inside an ancient hangar that housed two museum pieces. Spaceship One and Spaceship Two. Both were covered with a light film of dust. Inside the reception area, a kid lounged behind a lightweight aluminum desk, and a fog tank displayed images of the Ares. The kid wore the discreet white earpiece of a Dell brain machine interface. The access light glowed soft red, indicating he was offline. But his glazed eyes suggested that the BMI was on. Typical, Michael thought. He slapped a hand down on the aluminum desk. The kid jumped to his feet, looked around blindly for a moment, and finally fixed on Michael. What you want? He asked. I'm here for the welfare job. Oh yeah, welfare. Wait a minute. What welfare job? Michael offered the kid his hand. Oh no, put it on the slate. No sharing body data packages, I know that. We'll see who you are. Michael put his hand on the reader. The kid studied the big Pixcom icons in his roll screen and frowned. Yeah, right. It's a real job. Yeah, real funny, he said, mumbling something to his throat mic. Uh -huh. The screen changed, and his eyes widened again. You're kidding. No, Michael said. Now, now get, get the, the hell, hell out, out of my way, way and give me this, this job. job. The kid darted scared eyes from the screen to Michael and back again. Uh, Bob, you better come in here, he said. Sit down, uh, Mr. Uh, Delgado. Ten minutes later... A small balding guy with a halo cut appeared from somewhere deep within the hangar. He wore a sweat-stained white shirt and a really bad tie with pictures of old-fashioned circuitry on it. What's up? The kid tapped the screen. Bob took a look at it and blinked. Looked at Michael. Looked back at the screen. What is this? Looks like Tom flaked. Shit, Bob said. He always was a bit of a... The kid pinched two fingers around an imaginary joint and made sucking sounds. Can he do this? Post it to Wilfair? Bob asked. You can post anything. A friend of mine, he posted for a bunch of skinks to come to this guy's dorm room. So Tom could have done this. Again, the puffing. 
a nod, and a like-duh look from receptionist boy. And it's okay for him to get it? He said, nodding at Michael. The kid held up his hands. Not my problem, he said. Bob sighed (sighs) and turned to Michael. I'm sorry, Mr. Delgado. There seems to have been a mistake. It's too bad you had to come all the way out here. I'll see if I can get you credited for a- I want the job, Michael said. His voice sounded unusually strong and decisive. What? I don't want the credit. I want the job. There's been a mistake. No mistake. You posted a job. I accepted it. Binding welfare contract. Bob glanced at the kid. The kid tried unsuccessfully to hide a smile. I really can't take this seriously, Bob said. You don't have any of the qualifications to be an astronaut. Education, physical condition, psychological evaluations. Doesn't matter. The job was posted. I accepted. Done deal. Michael fought to keep his hands from curling into fists. I'll have you thrown out. Go ahead. Call security. Call Will Fair Legal, too, and see how long your jail sentence is. Bob frowned and muttered. He had the kid call up Will Fair Legal on the roll screen. The auto attendant was a porcelain-skinned blonde who looked far too good to be real. It listened, expressionless, as Michael and Bob both told their side of the story. Will Fair contracts are binding, it said finally. See? Michael said. Though the acceptor does have to meet the physical and mental qualifications of the job description, astronauts, even private ones, have extensive entry tests that must be passed, it continued. See? Bob said, smiling. He gestured toward the door. If I pass the tests, I get the job? Michael said. The contract is effectively binding. Bring it on. Bob's mouth dropped open. But... Get out the tests. I'll take them. There's no way you'll pass. Michael smiled. Wanna bet? It wasn't really cheating. Not really. Not when the connection was there for the taking. Not when the burning in his mind was saying, yes, yes, anything it takes. Fucking Vesper. Michael opened a window with his Kanye BMI and picked answers out of the global net. Images of Vesper's impossible Mars floated close in the back of his mind. The gleaming marble cities of Valera and Pentadon. The beautiful faces of the Arignes, calm like Greek gods under blonde ringlets. The slavering Ficarons the deep blue sky over twining blood-red forests, and feelings, the elation of quest, the brooding menace of the hall of dark memories. Those are not my memories. But every time he squeezed his eyes shut, the images just came brighter. Bob brought him pizza, plain, just cheese and sauce, The expression on his face said, Fuck you, fuckhead. I'm staying late for you. Why don't you just give up so I can go home? Michael ate, not tasting it, punching answers into the roll screen. Bob watched for a while, then left him alone. You're a frogger, Bob said when the test was done and scored. I passed, didn't I? You're a frogger. You have a BMI too, Michael said, nodding at the polished silver pebble he wore at his ear. I can turn mine off. Michael sighed. He would, too, if he could. But a free game BMI came at a price. You didn't turn it off. You didn't override it. A lot of people told him he was lucky the game was dead. At least he didn't have play alerts flashing in his mind, ruining his concentration. And he had a persistent connection to the global net. Of course, it also meant he could never be accepted to a serious college or take any real job. Because it wasn't his intelligence. Not really even though it took him years to figure out how to get an unencumbered connection to the global net, even though it took months to train himself how to use it, even though using it shouldn't be any different than looking up the answers in a book. The globe was covered in nets. He could surf virtually any one of them. He would have had the damn thing cut out years ago if he could afford it. You pulled the answers, Bob said. That's not fair. I passed the test, didn't I? That doesn't matter. Astronaut candidates aren't allowed to be fr- aren't allowed unauthorized brain interface machines. Michael wanted to jump up and strangle the man, but he made himself sit calmly. I'm calling welfare legal, he said. And I'll need to get our corporate counsel involved, Bob said. They made their calls. Automated attendants passed them quickly on to legal algorithmic services. 
Finally, two human lawyers appeared. They asked questions. Michael tried to keep his smile when he answered. Not that it would help. He was sure they knew exactly what he was thinking. Eventually, it boiled down to one point. You don't have a clause that states that a candidate cannot use a brain-machine interface during the test, Will Fair's lawyer said. She was a sharp-dressed woman in a blue business suit. We do clearly state that candidates are not allowed undefeatable BMIs, Edward Scaled Composite Virgin's lawyer said. He sounded a bit shrill. Determination of eligibility is your responsibility. By giving him the test, you've implied that he is an acceptable candidate. I'm referring this to the Federal Contracts Court. A frown. Wait. Edward Scaled Composite Virgin's lawyer addressed Bob. Give him the other tests. But he cheated. The frown deepened. Give him the other tests. Let me work on this. Bob glanced at his watch. I can't give him the physical or attitudinal until tomorrow. What do I do with him? Put him up in a hotel, the lawyer snapped. But you're under contract! Bob bowed his head and nodded. Michael didn't try to hide his smile. They put him in the Mojave Motel 6. Not much different than the Balboa Arms, really. Cheap plastic furniture and heavily patterned carpet and bedspreads to hide the inevitable stains. Ancient roll screens and limited wireless bandwidth. He even saw two Borgots hiding in an alcove. Apparently, Motel 6 had the same problem with guests overstaying their welcome. One difference. Great air conditioning. Michael turned it up to max and lay on top of the covers, letting the dry, chill air pour over his body. He let it strip the last bit of heat from his body. He let himself shiver in its icy blast. Is this me? He wondered. Is this this what I really really want? want? Michael closed his eyes and surfed to the latest data on Mars. The previous Ares missions. The bacteria. The fossils. The frozen seas buried under the red sands. One site had a simulation of what it would be like to stand on the surface of Mars without a spacesuit. Michael tried it. He felt his ears pop, felt the icy spike of cold, like clenching a piece of dry ice, but all over his body. He felt his chest heave and heave and bring in nothing. He felt his vision blur. And through it all, a smile. Vesper's doing that, he thought. He's making you feel this way. He should just go back to Van Nuys, take any Will Fairy could. But Mars... He should listen to Angelica. But he knew Mars wasn't the playground of his ancient Kanye game. He knew it wasn't marble cities and red jungles. And he still wanted to go. What is that me? He wondered. Memories came back. Playing that con me game for the first time, using nothing but a helmet, meeting the girl who would be for the first time, being Vesper, coming back the next day to play again and again, until the game store kicked him out, until he had done enough yard work to pay for the game, marked down and near the end of its life cycle. Installing the BMI that night. That night he opened his eyes and had a whole world in front of him, endless, as far as he wanted to grasp, that feeling of possibility, that feeling of freedom. It wasn't just Vesper, it was him. Michael closed his eyes, eventually he slept. The next morning was cold and gray. As the cab took him in, Michael Delgado watched a drunken video message from Angelica, taken in some dank little bar he didn't recognize. She was trading tongues with a rat-faced man with a big pompadour. There was also a text message from an email address Michael didn't recognize. Show them you can do it, Michael. Show them that you're not Vesper, but his spirit still lives. And another. Will fare or not, you're my hero. Michael frowned. A quick search on the mediascape with the keywords Michael Delgado, Will Fair, and Mars showed tiny sparks of activity, widely distributed on the smaller boards and blogs, with some waiting toward BMI gaming. Michael felt a swell of pride. He'd never done anything that hit the mediascape. He was still feeling buoyant when they took him out to the physical course. Bob was there, flanked by Edward's scaled composite virgin's lawyer. 
a short woman wearing a severe gray suit, stood several yards away from them. She strode forward and offered Michael her hand. I'm Felicia Ponderosa, she said. Welfare legal. From last night, Michael said. Yes, you're stirring up some media attention. I'm sorry. Felicia smiled. Don't be. If you make it, this is an important triumph for Welfare. It'd prove that we aren't just dog walking and grass cutting. Even if he passes the test, there is still a question of interpretation of intent regarding the written portion, said the Edwards lawyer. Felicia offered the man a thin smile and dragged Michael away from them. They're going to try and take this away from me, aren't they? Michael said. Felicia nodded. Can they? She sighed. I don't know. The physical test was something like an obstacle course. Michael ran, twisted, dodged, and jumped. All those years of lawn mowing, cleaning, and construction paid off. The course was easy. The Edwards lawyer bent close to whisper something to Bob. Some other way to fuck me, Michael thought. Some other trick to take away his prize. And in that moment, he almost stopped and walked off the course. Because even Felicia couldn't guarantee he'd get it. His step faltered. The little timer he'd set up in his internal view winked towards his disqualification. He felt eyes on him, some hungry, some disappointed. Eyes. The media, of course. Michael smiled. He ran faster. He beat the maximum time by tens of seconds. Bob looked at him grimly, arms crossed. But Michael didn't really notice. His attention was focused on the welfare site and on the job he'd just eye-typed. Job 230917055609 Public Protest Edwards Scaled Composites Virgin Lancaster Facility Main Entrance Help your fellow wheelfarer go to Mars See media details at this address One day credit per person Paid from my own account Maximum 720 credits We'll have to accept IOU Accept? Michael smiled at Bob as he passed They put him in a cage made of heavy copper mesh for the psych evaluation. The psychologist was a young, red-haired man with wide blue eyes and a smattering of freckles on his face. He let the two lawyers into the cage and made Bob stay outside. What's this? Michael asked, pointing at the copper mesh. Faraday cage, the psych guy said. Swept of line of sight transceivers hourly. We don't want you getting outside help on this test, do we? The heavy copper door clanged shut and latched. Every telltale on Michael's BMI went red. Michael felt suddenly lighter. The static in his mind was gone. He tried to pull a window on the global net and got nothing but smooth blankness. He was cut off for the first time in years. Michael laughed. (laughs) It was a weird feeling. How do you feel? The psych guy asked. Better. Still want to go to Mars? Of course. The psych guy nodded and they began. Michael recognized some of the questions from school. All of them were opinion-type questions. No wrong answers. Or so they said. Michael knew there were wrong answers, just like he knew they could tell when you were trying to spoof the right ones. He answered quickly, hoping for the best. When it was over, they took him into a little office where the psych guy ran the test and displayed the results on a privacy screen. He looked at Michael sharply. You're a Vesper, aren't you? He said. Michael felt his guts clench. He didn't know what to say. He opened his mouth, but no words came out. The psych guy smiled. You don't have to answer. I know you are. What's a Vesper? Bob asked. Vesper was a game character, the psych guy said. Kanye Games, Epic Mars, or Burroughs Pastiche. Vesper was the hero, the one who saved Mars from the depredations of the Irenyes. What does that have to do with him? Bob asked, pointing at Michael. Vesper was one of the early experiments and personality overlays in BMI Gaming. Which in itself wasn't bad, but the game was hacked and there were some adverse effects. Such as? Bob said. Many of the active players ended up with neural weighting that's a measurable percentage of Vespers. What does that mean? Vespers are part of them. Forever. Bob was silent. After a while, the Edwards lawyer spoke up. So this person's desire to go to Mars may be because he's part video game character? Side guy shrugged. I don't know. It's impossible to separate. So he failed the psych, Bob asked. A grin. 
Oh no, he passed just fine, with flying colors, as they say. All signs indicate he's substantially more stable than his predecessor. But he's not himself, Bob thundered. He's not really human. Looks like only about 1% of his neural weighting is Vespers, the psych guy said. And besides, our tests don't specify where you get your motivation. Edward's lawyer leaned close to Bob and said, There's precedent for disallowance, though. A case can be made based on undefeatable BMIs and external influences. You're going to have a hard time proving external influences, Felicia said. Why not? He's persistently connected to the outside. Do you want to prove there are no game stubs or backdoors into the Kanye code base? Felicia frowned and said nothing. But I passed all the tests, Michael said. He felt the familiar tension, the familiar build, like he should knock heads, break out of here, run into the red twining jungle. Felicia shook her head. Bob grinned. He turned to Michael. Michael forced himself to look into Bob's dark, beady eyes. He knew what he was going to say. The same speech he got whenever he applied for a real job. Sorry, no, can't take you. Don't know who you are. Save your money and have that game BMI taken out. And maybe we can talk later. Here's your hat. What's your hurry? But the receptionist kid came in, eyes wide, and everything changed fast. Outside the Edwards Scaled Composite Virgins facility, a sea of people pressed tight against the gates. A shimmering line of cars traced a silver river back towards the more populated part of Mojave. The scent of biodiesel hung in the air, like french fries from an old-style fast food restaurant. A cloud of smart smoke hovered over the crowd. It morphed from, fly Mike fly, to, if he passes, let him pass, and, end the BMI double standard. Many of the people outside the gate also held old-style painted signs or wove flash words around their bodies. They were too far away to read. Michael stopped just outside the building as the kid pointed to the crowd, and Bob and the lawyer had a quick huddle. Someone in the crowd pointed at Michael, and a ragged cheer went up. Michael felt lightheaded. But did he yell? This was way more than 720 people. He looked inside at his welfare account. Nobody had accepted his offer of credit. Instead, his feedback was full of comments like this. I'll come out anyway. Keep your credits. You deserve them. And, I'll be there. You don't need to bribe me. And, heard it through the mediascape. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Michael's feeling of lightheadedness grew. They were helping him on their own dime. On their own time. Because they wanted to. He raised a hand to the crowd. The ragged cheer swelled. Felicia bent close to Michael and said, Did you do this? Michael nodded, still looking at the crowd. How? Posted a welfare job? Offered my Aries credits to anyone who would come out and protest? Felicia smiled. Her eyes glimmered like Michael's mother's on the day he'd gotten his bachelorate degree. Was that you or Vesper? It was me. Felicia nodded. She went to join Bob and his lawyer. There was a lot of shouting and pointing at Michael. Bob's face turned red, and his expression squinted down into something that wouldn't look out of place on an Apple doll. The Edwards lawyer stood, expressionless, his eyes on the crowd. Michael was still connected to his welfare posting. He saw the media escape connections growing as he watched. People were feeding fuzzy video from the fence. Michael smiled. No doubt there were some microcams or grain of rice transceivers lying about. He did a quick search and found a good view of the argument and fed it into the global net. In the now clear video, Felicia said, I'd say the public has spoken. Do you still want to take this to court? There's no way we're going to let a, a, a thing that's part video game on the Aries, especially not on the first long-term crew, Bob yelled. A groan went up from the crowd as the media reached them. Bob's lawyer bent and whispered something in Bob's ear. Bob shot a murderous glance at the crowd and fell silent. So, you're going to argue that the welfare contract is invalid? Felicia said. Don't say anything, the Edwards lawyer said. Bob clamped his mouth shut over a frown. Then both of them looked up at a jeep that was approaching from within the Edwards Scaled Composites Virgin facility. It trailed a thin cloud of dust behind it as it sped across the vast concrete expanse. When it came close, Bob went pale and whispered in his lawyer's ear. The lawyer looked grim and nodded. 
The jeep passed within inches of Bob, ruffling his dark blue suit jacket. He flinched as it roared by. It skidded to a stop in front of Michael. The woman driver, a middle-aged blonde with hair just starting to gray and leathery desert sun skin, eyed Michael over the rim of tiny mirrored sunglasses. She wore a utilitarian gray coverall that bore the Edward Scaled Composites Virgin logo. She jumped down from the jeep as Bob and the lawyer came running. So you're the new man? She asked Michael, coming within 18 inches of him. Her eyes, blue ghosts behind the mirror shades, didn't waver from his face. I want to be, Michael said. Wrong answer, she said. Michael felt his hands clench. His stomach turned over and over as if it was trying to tie itself in knots. Captain? Bob said. She held up a hand. Bob's mouth clicked shut as if it were wired. Give Michael and me a minute, please. She walked Michael 50 yards away from the others. She stopped and looked at him. You know Mars isn't like the game, she said. Of course, Michael said. But... No beautiful princesses, no jungle, no air. I know. You know how long this mission is for? Three years. Longer if we want to stay. You know the chance of dying before you come back. 0.35%, Michael said. It had been one of the test questions. Do you want to stay on Mars? Michael felt his eyes go hot and wet. Yes, I do. A nod. What would you do to Mars if you could? She said. Make it like the epic. The woman looked at him for a long time, expressionless. Finally, she let a thin grin spread across her face. So you're the new man? she said. Michael remembered his answer, and her response. Yes, he said, standing straight. A laugh. (laughs) Who are you? Michael said. I'm the captain, Gloria Vandermeer. And you're okay with a video game character for a crew member? Gloria smiled. She bent close and whispered. I used to play Epic Mars too, though not as Vesper, as the girl who was to be. Michael couldn't say anything. She saw his expression and laughed. (laughs) Not much of the girl left, is there? She said. So much for the romance. No, I mean, if you played, how did you get into the program? I got out before the meltdown, and I paid to have the network hacked out of my head. But it still stays with you, the dream. Am I in? Gloria looked out over the desert. You'll like Roddy. I think he's almost 2% Vesper. Roddy? One of the crewmates. I'm in? Michael said. You have to ask? Michael's heart pounded. His hands felt slick and sweaty. He had a sudden vision of himself flying over the red jungle. He blinked it away and replaced it with a vision of himself trudging over salmon-colored sand. It felt just as good. The one question they don't ask, Gloria said. What percentage of astronauts get hooked on interactives? What percentage are carrying some bit of a hero around in their heads? Michael shook his head. You mean this was planned? A laugh, (laughs) long and hard. The setting sun painted Gloria's face in hues of gold. Want to go tell Bob the good news? She said. But you haven't answered my question, Michael thought. He opened his mouth to say something. Then he closed it again. Yes, he said. They went back to where the earthbound stood amid the cheers of the crowd. Author's note. Willpower is what one of my friends called the quintessential Stoddard story. In her words, the money gets weird, the government falls, and we go to Mars. It's partially because I like writing about times of transition, and transition to a post-scarcity economy is going to be mighty weird. Maybe even ugly, as it is here. And it's a reflection of my love of space. I deeply and completely believe we need a new frontier, because if there isn't, and if we don't take chances to make it happen, we are in deep trouble. And finally, I really enjoy characters who aren't afraid to take chances, who'll stand up and say, damn it, this is what I want. An editor friend of mine called it the screw you moment, except he used different words. So there you go, willpower. (laughs) 
and we're back! That's right, folks. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. Did you enjoy the story, Rish? I'm still trying to figure it out. There were a lot of concepts and terms that I was kind of lost on during yeah. that thing. Yeah, what is a Apple doll? That's one of the more self-explanatory of them, but yes, good example. <laughs> I bet if we looked that up, We'd see right away what it was. Oh, see, I thought that was a future thing. You know, like Cabbage Patch was in the 80s, Apple Dolls in the 2060s, you know. What is this? Oh, my Lord, they're the most horrible things imaginable. Okay, folks, if you're also somebody who doesn't know what Apple Dolls are, you're better off not knowing. Go back to that innocent point in your life when you still believed in the future. You still believe that politicians had your best interest at heart. That's where you should stay. Yeah, that was a pretty scary picture that comes up when you look up Apple Doll. But yeah, there were a lot of uh, fun futuristic stuff in this story. That's kind of one of those things about a futuristic story. Is you can't put the brakes onto your story every time you mention something that, that people in the future would totally understand. But perhaps might be unfamiliar to us and we just kind of have to let it slide and move on so how is it that we ran this story well a while back i was on the hugo awards website and they had a pdf that you could download that showed like the votes and this, this was, was for last year's hugo right for last year's this was the short list that they'd published or it could be called the long list i have no idea but it was a much longer list than what you get when you just get in the nominees there were some 40 or so short stories that people had voted for as, you know, this is something that should be considered for the Hugo. So I figured, well, heck, here's a place where I could find some interesting stories, I bet. And so I tried to read as many of those stories on that list as possible. And this was one of them that I thought, wow, this is a good story. I wonder if this guy would uh, be willing to let us do a, a podcast of it. So I sent him an email. And yeah, he was totally down with it. He was excited. And he said, yeah, go for it. So hopefully <laughs> he he found it to be uh, as good as the idea sounded in his head when he uh, first got my email. I don't know how long ago it was, months, we were talking on the air and you said that I know of a writer who's doing all that he can to get optimistic science fiction back in the mainstream. Was this who you were talking about? This was the guy that I was talking about, yeah. What What, what does that mean? I think it's got to do with the fact that probably like a huge preponderance of your fiction that you get these days when they look towards the future, it's always the end of humanity is coming, you know, Al Gore is right and the world is going to be completely covered in water because the ice caps will melt and there'll be no place for the polar bears to go and pretty soon, one way or another, be it an asteroid coming down or... The rape aliens... The rape aliens landing at our doorstep. One way or another, the world is going to fall apart. You know, there's a lot of that kind of stuff in science fiction. And I think he's just trying to give you the idea that it doesn't have to be that way. The future doesn't have to be awful. It could be even better than it now is, you know. I don't know where I read this or heard this, but years ago I heard this, you know, in the 50s people still believed in progress they still believed that things will get better as time goes by and these days people just don't seem to believe that anymore it's kind of gone away people look to the future and they think it's going to be worse and worse and worse this is air quality i'm not going to be able to breathe i'll have to wear one of those masks that like the people in beijing wear all, everywhere they go we'll all be broke and the, the government won't be able to pay social security blah 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 it seems like it's always kind of a mixed bag, really. The future, there are things that are better and there are things that maybe aren't better. But tons of progress has been made and it's made people's lives better. So perhaps this could keep on happening. I don't know. But like I think back at like the works of Isaac Asimov, for example. I, I just read I, Robot for the first time. I'm sorry. I really enjoyed it. It's different in a lot of ways from the stuff that you get now in that it's just got that positive look at the future. Things are just getting better. The robots will keep advancing and keep helping us out even more. And it's just something that you don't hear as much anymore. It's just one of those things that kind of 
seems to have gone away. Not like I'm an expert in what's going on in science fiction or the f history of science fiction either. But, you know, from what I can tell, it seems like we could use a lot more optimistic works out there. This is totally off the subject, but I remember when they brought back uh, The Outer Limits in 1995. Um, it was on the Showtime network, so I couldn't see it, of course. Um, but then it got into syndication. So the next year, you could just see it on regular TV. And the very first episode I saw was, I even remember, it was called The Quality of Mercy. And it was just so astoundingly dark. The ending was just a slap in the face of holy crap, life is so, so bad that it stuck with me all this time. And so, of course, the next week, I wanted to watch Outer Limits again. And the next week, you know, it's just like twist ending, you're all <laughs> And it's like, oh, wow, geez. Now, so I tuned in the next week. It's like the, the next week, you've all got a disease. You're all and after three or four weeks, I started to realize, oh, every week, the worst thing that you could imagine happening is going to be what happens. And, you know, it sort of started to bum me out, and I didn't look forward to watching Outer Limits as much. And, you know, when I would tune in, I'd be like, no, come on, just let them win this time, or let humanity evolve, or let's find out that we can be better than the generation before. Oh, no, ah, no, well, the rape aliens came. Okay, <laughs> the end. And yeah, it's just one of those things where I started to yearn for a happy ending, yearn for something positive and bright. And granted, they did like 150 episodes. So surely some of those had happy, positive, optimistic endings. But that's what I thought of when you were talking about science fiction being dystopian, being pessimistic now. And just like, give us something to hope for, please. Yeah. Give me a reason to tune in next week. We talked just a couple weeks ago about the tragic endings and how they have power. But they only have power if they're in the minority. You know what I mean? If every week it's tragic, you're just pretty soon going to give up. It's like ER. You know, we talked about that and how I just couldn't watch it anymore because every week, man, somebody died horribly and somebody's life was ruined. Yeah, at a certain point, it's like, I just can't take it anymore. And apparently Jason Stoddard is one of those guys who couldn't take it anymore, and so he decided to make it a bit of a quest to champion optimistic science fiction. I think that's cool. With optimistic science fiction, sometimes you run the risk of the problem of Star Trek The Next Generation, where everybody gets along, and Gene Roddenberry's vision of the future was that we had evolved past racism and bickering, pettiness, selfishness, greed, avarice, lust... The Seven Deadly Sins. Sloth. <laughs> all of the things that that guy killed Wrath of with. Khan. Gluttony. I've, I've already named them all. Which is really, really interesting. And it was unlike most people's vision of the future. And I know that that gave a lot of people hope. But it was really difficult for the writers to come up with drama. Right. And drama is based in conflict. And if one of your tenets is you cannot have conflict. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Maybe I didn't mention one of Roddenberry's rules was that the Starfleet officers always got along and they didn't argue and they didn't disagree and they didn't fight with each other so that the writers had to come up with outside stimuli and it had to be aliens or if there was some kind of argument or, or one of the crew members attacked another crew member, it was because they were possessed by an alien or some kind of artifact or the intelligence that they gotten from the computer or it was a holodeck creation and all that stuff and i know that that really hampered the creativity of some of these writers and then roddenberry died and suddenly it was okay for it went out the window people and yeah i i know that that probably bothers some star trek fans but as soon as roddenberry died i think they felt like some of the weight was off their shoulders and they could say well hey it's all right for picard and Riker to disagree because they, they could both be right, or they might not have all the information and all that stuff. As long as they're both good men, it's it's okay if they disagree. And, that, and then we got into Deep Space Nine, where the characters were a lot grayer, and everybody did things that was wrong, and everybody made mistakes and all that stuff. And uh, it, it opened up the possibilities. And those characters on Deep Space Nine were just so rich, and the, the, the interpersonal relationships were so interesting. And you know, the best episode of Deep Space Nine is the one where... Captain Sisko does this unconscionable thing. 
And he wonders if he can live with himself because he felt like he had to do it to save thousands of – to save millions of lives. He had to betray everything that that Starfleet uniform stood for and it was compelling as hell because he made the right decision but on paper it's the wrong decision. Guess I guess you have to have it both ways. Just like we said, you know, can't all end tragically. But there also has to be the possibility of an unhappy ending. Yeah. The threat that the aliens could win or that humanity could be wiped out. But at the same time, we don't want just everybody hugging and dancing around. And I I remember I was telling you about watching and what I was doing watching My Little Pony, I don't know. (laughs) I was at my uncle's house and his daughter was watching what, My Little you, Pony. you don't know? You watch it every week. Come on. All right. You, you know me a little too well. And this was a show where there was no conflict at all. I sat there because we were all over there for Sunday dinner or something like that. And he had this stuff that she was watching. And it was just absolutely stress and conflict-free entertainment. <laughs> Basically, they had to come up with harmless drama Uh on this show and it was like one of the ponies is throwing a party but there's only four seats and five invitations have come and it's like oh gee we wouldn't want anybody to feel left out and i was just like wow because i'm a boy (laughs) and in all boys programming from the dawn of time there have been bad guys yeah, I mean, even Smurfs and things like that. Yeah, there was a Gargano. There were people that were diametrically opposed to our main characters because you need that. Yeah. And with My Little Pony, part of me was kind of fascinated <laughs> by this because it was utterly worthless. But these writers, these poor, poor writers <laughs> had to come up with something that's somewhat compelling to fill their 15-minute show. And so, yeah, that's what it's like. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to have a picnic oh no, it's raining. Okay, how do we overcome this obstacle? The rain, it was acid rain. It turned them all into skeletons. <laughs> it was the best My Little Pony I ever saw. Yeah, you know, I wonder if that has anything to do with us evolving as Gene Roddenberry wanted humanity to evolve. Because when I was a kid, you know, I watched all the boys' shows pretty much, but I had a couple of sisters and they wanted to watch the Care Bears or they wanted to watch the Strawberry Shortcake show. So I saw my fair share and they had villains in those days. There was the Purple Pie Man, I think was his name, from Strawberry Shortcake. I'll get you, Strawberry, <laughs> you bitch. Yeah, and Whoa. there was, I want to say, well, there was the Star Stealer. Star, oh, that was Rainbow Bright, huh? What? So there were enemies to the Care Bears? Yeah, there was, I think, Cold Heart, maybe. They all had heart Ooh, names. I like that. No Heart, I think, was one. The Wallaby of Wickedness. But anyways, yeah, there was a couple of uh, bad guys in those shows. And these were basically girls shows, I think. But yeah, as time has gone by, maybe that's just gone away. For example, my son is a Cub Scout, right? This weekend was the Pinewood Derby for my son's group. Okay, if there's somebody not in America listening, oh, explain right. what the Pinewood Derby is. A Pinewood Derby is you get a little block of pine and you have to, with your dad, get together and you make a car out of this thing. And then they have a little track, which basically is just a hill, and you set them up on there and they race down this track and you see who wins the race. Whoever has the fastest car wins. At least that's the way it was when I was a kid. Oh, yeah, me too. (laughs) Now, they still do that. They still race them. They still give an award to whoever had the fastest car. But these days, they also give an award to every kid, Cub Scouts or whoever, has mandated every child must get an award. So the poor leaders, my wife actually is one of the den mothers or whatever they're called. They had to come up with awards for these kids. And so each kid, would they were like, hey, and this kid won the most excellent award. And then the next award is this kid's car was the most fantastic award. So pretty much all the awards are basically the same stupid thing. The most cool award, the most slick award. And they just come up with a different word that means the same thing, but... There's Not. somebody with a thesaurus leaping through it as fast Seriously. as they can. <laughs> That's oh. what it was like. And then benign. Gets... <laughs> benign award. It gets down the line. And my son's car was a black car. And so it won the Darth Vader Award. Ooh, and that's actually pretty cool, though, right? <laughs> Which meant nothing. My son kind of thought the Darth Vader Award was cool. 
I guess it's kind of cool. Well, then they accomplished bigger. what they were setting out. The sad thing is, the year before, this one really makes me cringe. His car won the fattest car award. Not and with a PH. Yes, with oh. the PH. Rectus <laughs> Dominus. And yeah, it makes me so sad to see that kind of crap. He didn't win anything. He didn't earn anything. He didn't do anything. And because he still got an award, I don't think he feels like the motivation to next year, I'm going to make the fastest car and we're going to win next year and I'm going to try really hard. He doesn't have that because he gets an award for whatever. I mean, you can come in there with a block with nothing done to it and wheels on it and be like, okay. And they'd be like, yeah, you won the ugliest award. (laughs) It's just kind of bugs me when that kind of crap happens. Cause instead of being motivated to go out and achieve something and accomplish something and be the best, you're like, well, if I don't do crap, I still get an award and that's all I wanted. So I just won't do anything. And it's good enough. It's very Republican of me to say something like that, isn't it? take that back well um, but i'm i'm not a republican and i agree with you hey, completely so pretend i never said that i mean i think they're just things that are common sense now I, it's like we can't have tag we can't have dodgeball we can't have these games where scores are kept yeah because that's going to stunt somebody's emotional growth or that's going to hurt somebody's feelings or that's going to make somebody feel like they're not on the winning side and now it's time for rish's off-topic ramble of the week I don't have kids, so I guess I'm an unfeeling shit. (laughs) But the truth is, in life, you're not going to win all the time. Everybody needs to know this, that sometimes you are going to lose. Sometimes the game is not going to be fair. And you need to know what it's like to hold your head up high and say, hey, I did my best. And if we got 17 to 0, they kicked our asses. I still went out there and I sweated and I played and I have some kind of self-respect. Dude, to me, that is such an important thing. It's how to lose gracefully and and it's it's important to not give up in the face of trial and and somebody undercutting you or, or, or the rules being against you or the game just not working out the way that you want it to. I remember being a little kid and, you know, you'd lose on a video game. You'd throw the controller. (laughs) And who knows what happens with kids now? Like they throw it through the window and lands on some poor homeless guy. I don't know. Anyway, from the look on your face, I guess I've been talking too long. But I believe it's important to keep score just because in the real world, you can guarantee that people keep score. Yeah, it's definitely the way it is. I work with a lot of people that... Some of them, you can tell they don't want anybody to keep score and they don't want to have to try as hard as the other people do. And then there's those that try really hard and they do great. It's nice to work with the people that try really hard. Not nice to work with those that don't. It's something that people need to learn. And I don't know if this ties back into our conversation that we started with where we were talking about, you know, optimism, still needing optimism and yet Also, I guess, needing the opposition. You need to know that the good guys don't always win, but you also need to know that the good guys will win sometimes if they do their best. Try hard, and maybe you'll get the reward in the end. You know, but you've got to do the work or else you're not going to get the reward in the end. And that's an important thing in life as in fiction. Like our guy in this story, you know, he stumbled upon an amazing chance to go from being the guy who's mowing people's lawns to being the guy who's riding the rocket to Mars. He still had to pass the tests. I mean, he did well on some of them, had a little uh, luck with some of the others, was you know able to click right into the network or whatever to get through the, the others. And not only that, but he really engineered his uh, trip to Mars himself when he drummed up that mob of uh, folks that came out in support of his cause that was the thing that changed it from you know maybe we can manage to find a loophole to don't say anything you know that was something really optimistic and positive in the story was that he had to bribe all these people to come out and support him and without fail all of them said no you don't have to pay me we'll support you on our own and that's one of those things where it's like gosh would people do that in real life I hope so Yeah. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about on this 
his motivation for going to Mars. Oh, okay, this year, Avatar became the biggest movie oh, right. of all time. Who would have guessed? I, it wasn't me. I think we talked on this very show, and I said, I don't think it's going to pass Titanic or come close to that, but... I don't think it's going to get a bunch of Oscar nominations, you know, one of those things. But one of the things that people have been saying, and it's, it's usually the opponents of Avatar, one of the reasons people go again and again to see this movie is that they love this imaginary world. Yeah. They long to be there with the Na'vi and, and they, the plants that go... Bloop. <laughs> and riding the dragons and, you know, just that the, the, this is an amazing place that they would rather be than the mundane world that they're in right now. This imaginary world appeals to something within themselves. And, and for me, it was a sense of wonder, a childlike sense of wonder of, wow, anything could happen here. It might have a little bit to do with that Jake was safe. He wasn't really out there falling from trees and all right. that stuff. That was an avatar. That was an escapist kind of thing. I, I, that could be argued either way, I guess. But I could see that saying, I wish I could be a Navi the way that Jake is and go and, and bang Natiri and ride the creatures <laughs> and, and fight and shoot an arrow and stick my ponytail into the horse creature. Whoa. And because I'd still be me, but I can experience this and... And if that ever got tiring or boring or I wanted to go back to my old life, I could wake up. I know a lot of people that don't like the movie are just like, oh, weird. this is escapist crap. And, you know, what? that's a, oh, so much better than the real world. Oh, yeah, fuck you. OK, but any story that captivates you and takes you away and creates a world that just grabs onto your imagination and squeezes that's just so awesome. And you and I both know what that's like to see a movie or read a book or play a video game or in your case, have sex with lots of really cool girls where you're just, okay, scratch that part, where you're enthralled by something that somebody else has created and, and you long to be there. We were talking about the teenage girls going to see Titanic again and again and again uh -huh. and that Avatar didn't have that. What it has is that escapist, yeah. that world that is unlike anything we have. Unlike enough that that's where you long yeah, to be. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and I think that's what has put butts in seats for so long on Avatar. I can't explain it because there will be people that tell you how terrible the writing is. Because people always do that. I don't understand. There will be people that tell you how terrible the acting is. I've even heard people tell me how bad the special effects are in Avatar. Huh. So, you know, I mean, it's, there's always a contingent of people that are unhappy with whatever is popular. And they have to tell you why fill in the blank is lame. The more popular it gets, the more of those people there are, too. Do I think that Avatar is the greatest movie of the 21st century? No, I don't. But am I glad that it is the number one movie of 2009 and not Transformers 2? Oh, heck yes. <laughs> Immensely glad. Cameron took a real risk, as he always does, with this movie. It's just astoundingly expensive and it paid off in droves the same way that like his last few have. I, 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 here we are talking about Avatar again, <laughs> but it's been out for months and people are still talking yeah, about it. And I can guarantee you that in the summer, there will still be people that talk about Avatar. Rambling. So a big, you can probably guess where I'm, wait, can you guess where I'm going here with this? <sighs> It's always kind of hard to follow where you're going when you ramble this badly, but I think what you're trying to say is that these people who love Avatar, being have made it the box office bazillionaire of all time, although in today's dollars, it's a giant failure. Made crap. I think what you're trying to say is that these people are similar to like our, our main character of our story that we have. You know, he loved his game so much that he went out and mowed lawns until he made enough money that he could get himself a... I think it was called a BMI, the brain machine interface, which I believe makes it so like his brain sees what the game is telling him to see or it means he can watch it with his eyes instead of having to watch it on a screen or something like that. He loved it so much. And, and then, unfortunately for him, he's got this thing stuck in his head forever it, to the point that the character is even part of him. So he is so into this that he'll go to Mars no matter what, even though Mars is nothing like what his game is like. He still wants to go. 
even his motivation. Now you have to wonder how much of it is his game character that's kind of pushing him to go and how much of it is himself as someone that wants an adventure and wants to do something with his life, prove that he's more than just a guy that walks dogs. I guess that's where you were going. Was I anywhere near it? I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, we were talking about positive science fiction, and you can't listen to anybody that was involved with the original Star Trek without them telling you that they've met scientists and real-life astronauts, people that have gotten into a chosen field because of this fictional future that they loved. First black woman in space, she was on an episode of Star Trek, and she said Trek inspired her to get where she was. So I think it's it's kind of similar where it was a fictional Mars, uh-huh. and yet this guy didn't care. He had to go to Mars. Yeah. And the Star Trek space, the final frontier, is fictional, but it's so powerful for some people that they're like, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to work for NASA. I'm going to go out there and yeah. be the first person to have sex on Mars. I think it's more likely you'll be the first to have sex in Uranus. <laughs> That's not funny, man. <laughs> not funny at all. You know, it's funny because I actually read an article. I think it was on the internet. It was really an article. It was more like a spoof article. They were joking about these people that loved Avatar so much that it it was making them depressed. There were support groups there for them so they could go there and introduce themselves and talk about how being unable to be 15 foot tall and blue has, has really ruined their lives and making them too sad to go on in their drab humdrum world. That's funny. I think I read the same article, but I, I'm not sure that I knew it was a joke. So there's <laughs> that. My niece is nine, and for some reason she's always playing this online game. Well, not for some reason. The entire point of this game is to be as addictive as possible <laughs> and appeal to everything that a, a teen girl or a preteen girl would like, you know. And uh-huh. so she gets to design her outfit and interact with other people and... and uh, 50-year-old guys pretending to be nine-year-old girls asking for her social security number. and uh-huh. It's irritating because she's just addicted to it and she can't get off of it. But uh-huh. I've never really been a video game guy. I, I always feel guilty if I play uh, a lot of video games or, or if I watch a lot of television. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if I, I sleep a lot because there are so many things that I should be doing, whether it is working on this podcast or writing or 101 other things that I actually should do. And I can't really do the amount of wasting time that she does. Yeah. Although there was this episode of House just this year where there was a game designer, a video game designer, and we got to see this game that he was working on. It's supposed to be like the next level of video games where you put on this virtual reality helmet and you have this Wii type controller that looks like a gun. Uh-huh. And you go into this artificial environment where everything is, is phony around you, but you see it 360 degrees. No matter where you look, you're in this other world. And the other people that you're playing with don't look like themselves, but they look like characters or creatures that have been designed by this game. You aren't you either. Uh Your friends see you as a a big boobed chick or or an alien or a robot or something like that. Right. And I thought, holy cow, if this game existed, I would play this thing 10 hours a day. This would be awesome. (laughs) And, you know, I don't live in a cave, so I know that we don't have games like that yet. Uh But, you know, your kids, by the time they're in high school or at least by the time they have kids, I think we'll have kids Yeah, I like wouldn't that. be surprised. And I could see being that addicted to something like that. Yeah, that would be cool. I've always thought that would be neat to have some kind of virtual reality kind of thing that you could just stick on your helmet or whatever, and it was like you were really there. I'm sure that would only be corrupted and used for evil by me. I had to be right there with you, man. Well. <laughs> A few feet away, hopefully. Well, I'm sure there'd be some kind of acceptable standard of distance between players in this situ- scenario like that. Right. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? Somebody out there saw some virtual reality porn and said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make that happen. I'm going to go into video game design and or porn because I have what I saw. Like the Trekkies. Yeah. So, uh, positive science fiction, I think this was good stuff. Yeah, I agree. It was fun. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go. No, I was going to say we had a lot more to say beyond that, but I don't know if I even have to tell people. Computer crashed again. Yeah. 
So uh, we lost all that, and uh, rather than record more, we're just going to bring this to a gentle halt. Yeah, hopefully uh, we said something in this abbreviated time that was worth listening to. I, I don't know that it was abbreviated. <laughs> Seems like we were rambling for quite a while, but That's, not that an is hour true. Instead, of- instead of our normal three times the length of the story type episode, it'll be more or less even this time. And now it's time to... <laughs> yeah, I'll get it done. Rish, give me three things you hate more than asking for donations. Donations. Well, can I count the way you say donations? <laughs> you said it, Rish. Give me three things you hate more than asking for donations. We have to do it. Okay, let's see. One, when you go on YouTube looking for a video clip or a song and a hundred amateur videos where people have taken scenes from like Boy Meets World or Mama's Family and edited them together with a Jewel song or a Buddy Holly classic playing over them come up. Okay, that's one. Two, that progressive insurance woman. You know the one with the brown red hair and the snotty attitude. Man, one look at her squinting, bunched up, holier than thou face. And I can hear the emperor laughing. Good, good. The hate is flowing through you now. Calm down, dude. Good. Take your meds. Oh, yeah. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> ah. Look like you picked the wrong week to stop sniffing glue, huh? So that's two. Anything else you hate more than asking our listeners uh, to hit the donate button? Let's see. Oh, I also hate it when you're flipping through the channels on the radio and a song starts up that sounds like a song you already like. I mean, it's a, it's a virtual knockoff of Matchbox 20 or, or, or Five for Fighting or, or Lady Gaga or whoever you like. And after a second, you realize that it's a Christian rock song with words like faith or heaven or Jesus or leper in place of love in the lyrics. Yeah, and it's like they tricked you into listening to it. Uh, okay, Rish. That's fine. Yeah, there ought to be a law against that, you know? Yeah, sure. So... That is blatantly immoral. And, and for, for some kind of religious music group to be ripping people off or, or defrauding the public, that's got to be a conflict of interest, don't you think? Okay, I'll do it. Jeez. And now it's time to beg for donations. Folks, we pay our authors, and the money often comes out of my pocket... But you could help us out by clicking on the donation button on the right side of our website and making a donation. Thanks in advance. You don't know how many times I've stopped on that station and I thought, wow, I didn't know Counting Crows had a new song out. And a second later, I realized the whining isn't about heartbreak or or San Francisco winter depression, but it's about a wayward churchgoer who doesn't realize that he's fallen. All right. So I guess that was our show then. Yes. Uh, thank you for listening all the way to the end, sir. And uh, as usual, I have been Rish Outfield. And uh, I was Big Anklevich. Earth below us, drifting, falling, floating weightless, coming, coming home. Ah. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I love that song. Warning, today's episode contains singing. <laughs> the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. Even if he passes the test, there is still a question of interpretation of intent regarding the written portion, said the Edwards lawyer. Is that douchey enough? It's pretty douchey. It's pretty darn douchey. I'm willing to guess that the uh, Edwards lawyer's last name is Summers Eve. Ooh. I wonder what his first name is. John Summers Eve. Hi, I'm John Summers Eve. Daniel Massengill, nice to meet you. (laughs) Take two. What kind of a robot should I be like? Job two three zero nine one. What do you think? Or should That's I do it probably more? Probably fine. Or you could, you know, you don't have to be gay. You could just be <laughs> monotone. Job two three zero oh, nine one seven zero oh, three. It's like wow. I'm trying to do sound wave. Job. Oh my lord! Not gay. Not. Soundwave was not in love with Megatron. He was just loyal. 
job two three zero nine one seven zero three four two four five five frack i got lost you almost got it <laughs> needed for a smooth transaction to a post scarcity transition god needed for a sm- Needed for a smooth transition to a post scarcity economy, they said. Scarcity. God damn it. Needed for a... Needed... (laughs) (laughs) Michael felt something like an electric... Boogie, woogie, woogie. Michael felt something like an electric shock. It had to be a cover for something that involved Hershey's syrup and chickens and octogenarians. It had to be something... Octogenarians. Octa. Octa? Uh-huh, like octopus. I'm more sweet dreaming. I thought you had it under control. I thought you were okay. Behind her, heads turned to look. They were offended by her stereotypical <laughs> asinine accent. <laughs> a small balding guy with a halo cut appeared from somewhere deep within the hangar. He wore a shit-stained brown underwear. He wore a sweat-stained white shirt. The deep blue sky over twinning. Twining. The deep blue sky over twinning. <laughs> the deep blue sky over twining blood red forests. <laughs> Even though it took him years to figure out how to get an unencumbered connection to the colo- Damn it. Even though it took him years to figure out how to get an unencumbered. Say it. Unencumbered. You're right. Even though it took him years to figure out how to say unencumbered. I mean, and, and we've talked about the, just the negativity of science fiction a lot. And, geez, I, I, I hate to go off on yet one more tangent, but I'm going to. Uh, the other day, and I don't even know how it happened, but I ended up seeing Starship Troopers 3. Okay, there's a 3. I didn't know there was a 2. Well, nobody saw 2. And I think just between you and me, one person saw 3, and <laughs> you're talking to him. But in the future of Starship Troopers 3, all religion has been outlawed. Oh. And they have the little uh, media program things at the beginning, and, and it says, you know, as you know, any worship of God or expressed belief in God is punishable by death. And there's this group of human characters, and they crash on this planet, and one of them happens to be religious, and she just never shuts up about it the whole time. Uh-huh about God this and what about God that and uh, the other characters are all just freaked out because she's saying stuff that you're obviously not supposed to say and, uh-huh. and like one character goes shit and she goes oh that's blasphemy and you know I was just scratching my head yeah but okay yeah it was just badly done but <laughs> there was one moment that, that I thought was worth mentioning they get into this horrible situation where there's no chance that they'll survive and all the remaining humans all decide to join this girl, and they all start doing the Lord's Prayer, and you know they're asking God to help them. And uh-huh. Boom! This miraculous rescue happens, and they all get to survive. And you mean a Deus ex machina? I believe that would be. Uh, if I were smarter, I would have used that term, but I didn't. So you know they've gone back and told everybody what happened, and and at the end of the movie, you get another one of those media breaks. And the entire human populace has been converted to religion. And they say something like, praise God, everyone. And remember, not professing to believe in religion, it's punishable by death. (laughs) Nice. uh, I thought, wow, that's funny, dude. You know, it's kind of a shame that I had to sit through 80% of a really mediocre show for these nuggets here and there of stuff that was good. So this is just a complete tangent that really has nothing to do with anything that we're saying? Well, the problem is I think it had something to do with it the first time I told this story. Oh, yeah. (sighs) We just quit while we're ahead. What do you think? (laughs) That's probably a good idea.